Okay, this is the beginning of the second tape. <clears throat> Pardon me, with, uh, we're with Bob Shemp. It's uh, April the 13th, 2009. And Bob, as we changed tapes, we were talking about uh, your involvement in power issues on the State Water Project and how DWR, the Department of Water Resources, operates their system and uh, how that benefits the various contractors, including Metropolitan. So if we can, without even a, a solid question, let's see if we can pick it up from there. Okay. Um, as I previously indicated, um, most of my involvement started in the early 80s and familiarizing myself with many of their power resources and what have you. Many of the contracts that they had expired in 83, and they were developing additional resources for after that period of time when those contracts expired. Prior to that time, uh, real integral to their operation were the hydroelectric plants that they had internal to their aqueduct, and these were big hydroelectric plants as opposed to our smaller plants that we had internal to our system. They had power plants at Devil Canyon, they had power plants at uh, Pyramid, um, they had a joint venture with the Department of Water and Power at Cass State, they had a power plant at San Luis, uh, and then, of course, the biggest, which was really there, is below Orville, is uh, Hyatt Thermolito power plant, which all of the power from that plant was obligated for pumping in the aqueduct, but the peaking nature of the resource and what have you went to the major utilities in the state, with the exception of DWP. They opted to stay out of it, but it was... Um, Edison, I believe, San Diego Gas and Electric, and PG&E that got the power output from Warville and then gave it back to them during their need in the off-peak, and then they would supplement their energy requirements through uh, purchases from what they called the supplier's contract, a very favorable contract negotiated in the 60s for three mil power, which pretty mil, which meant that you could get an acre foot of water through the state water project for about ten dollars which was very reasonable and uh, and that all existed up until 83 when those contracts terminated and pg and a did not opt to be involved in the renegotiations nor did san diego gas and electric i might have said county water authority but it was san diego gas and electric earlier in any event, uh, it was Edison that stepped up and worked up an integration agreement with their Hyatt Thermolito, Devil Canyon, uh, Pyramid, their other power plants, and are the, were the primary ones that governed the next 20-year period up until, I believe it was 2003, that those contracts expire. Um, and they essentially operated their aqueduct in an off-peak operation until the demands on the aqueduct built and they had to pump more and more water in the on-peak windows. You're talking on a daily basis. On right? a daily peak basis on they would cycle the pumps and of course there's a cost to do that. Uh, we found even on the Colorado River aqueduct that uh, the units were pretty solid and reliable. You'd put them on, you wouldn't ex have to exercise them and the maintenance on them was somewhat minimal. You start cycling units on and off, it's just like a light switch. Eventually you got to replace the light bulb when you keep flipping it on and off. And uh, big pumps are that way as well. And there was much more maintenance on the pumps by cycling them on and off, but if you looked at the maintenance on them versus the po cost of the power, it was still cost effective to cycle them on and off to maximize the pumping in the off-peak period and minimize the costs on the aqueduct. Uh, there was a collection of agreements that was worked up before I really got actively involved for that next 20-year period from 83 to 2003, but it was with Edison Company and, uh, and a collection of resources in addition because their demands were developing instead of just having to buy in the on-peak, it made more sense to have long-term resources to meet those needs. And a couple of those, one of them was our small hydro, it wasn't a lot of power, but it was one of the first resources they secured for that post period, starting in 83. They also got a part interest in a power plant in uh, 
in, in Nevada, the Reed Gardner Power Plant that they work jointly on with Nevada Power Company, and I believe they're still getting a piece of that power plant. It was a 30-year contract, but uh, uh, I think there are rights of renewal, et cetera. And it was a joint venture again where much of the power they'd take more in the off-peak uh, windows and let Nevada Power Company during a narrow beam in the on-peak use it for their own peaking operations. And then there was a collection of two or three geothermal plants because there was a lot of pressure for them to get into some of the green resources during that period of time. Uh, Bottle Rock, South Geysers, and I forgot what the third one was. And those were turned out to be major lemons. Um, it's the only thing kind to say about them. Uh, they, it was probably the lesser of the evils, the green resources that maybe DWR was being forced by the state to get into, but the various parties that thought the geothermal resources were the way to go in that area up in Sonoma County, too many straws in the ground, whatever, I think the Magnasource was still there, but the geothermal steam was drying up and they had to not complete one of them and the other one they eventually mothballed and I don't know what the final status was in terms of walking away from them. Uh, the plants themselves for a simple shutdown it's not possible. The uh, geothermal steam when it's brought up from the ground has arsenic and other toxic materials in them and it all needs to be hauled away to a hazardous site etc. So the facility still may be there. Uh, in any event, that's one of the resources that did not pan out that well. Well, since you brought up Bottle Rock and South Geysers, rather than leave a void on the tape, uh, they are both still there. Uh, they cost about a million dollars a year to maintain. Uh, my understanding is that the contracts require the department to restore the area to its natural condition if they ever abandon them. And so they have not been abandoned. Uh, they're empty, they're non-productive, but there's a, the Department of Water Resources carries uh, an item on the budget. It's about a million dollars a year. Uh, Which is probably the most cost-effective thing to do. Exactly, in right. By spending the million, they don't have to spend, you know, 40 times that to restore the area. So yeah, it, very interesting. Bottle Rock and South Geysers, if anybody ever wants to, do a research on projects gone bad, those are a couple of good ones. So, I'm sorry, I just okay. wanted to bring that to a conclusion. Um, and the next major window in DWR's uh, arena, as long as the contracts were honored under the renewal, uh, under the uh, restructuring here in California, and hence one of the reasons DWR joined the resale cities and met in on the cry in the restructuring of honoring existing contracts was going to be after 2003. And uh, I believe under that the Edison operation of Warville terminated. I do not know what the status is. I, I imagine that DWR is operating it themselves for the benefit of the State Water Project. Um, and they have con another major element that's been ongoing was that the high thermal plant, which again very integral to their operation like Hoover was to ours, was a 50-year contract for the license of that power plant and that expired in 2007 and I believe they're under the renewal process right now for that resource and renew it, basically having a one year at a time renewal while they meet the various demands that are placed on them. How would you characterize the relative cost uh, on the Colorado River Aqueduct versus the cost on the State Water Project to move an acre foot of water uh, a given length, or, or maybe to deliver it to MWD, whatever works there for you? I, I just try to give people a sense of, uh, of cost here. On the Colorado River Aqueduct, the the net cost, the net amount of energy is roughly 2,000 kilowatt hours per acre foot. The State Water Project, it does vary somewhat significantly between the east and west branch. The east branch being the one that terminates 
uh, down in Lake Paris and the West Branch being the one that terminates at Cass Stake. If you look at the power recovery along the way on the aqueduct, the net requirements, I believe, on the East Branch is about 33, 3,400 kilowatt hours an acre foot. And on the West Branch, I believe it's around 2,600. The overall average between the two is nominally about 3,000 acre foot. I think we used to look at it in terms of a mined hook where a barrel of oil would generate roughly 600 kilowatt hours. So it would take five barrels of oil, if you were, uh, if you will, to pump an acre foot of water from the delta net through the aqueduct and deliver it to Southern California, the equivalent of the 3,000 kilowatt hours an acre foot, and roughly three uh, three barrels of oil on the Colorado River Aqueduct. Colorado River Aqueduct was less energy intensive. The actual unit cost in terms of the power varies significantly depending upon the conditions that existed. And many of the times what we were doing was looking at a balance between the water quality issues in Southern California with the State Water Project water being better water quality in terms of overall total dissolved solids than the Colorado River Aqueduct uh, being probably the preferred source other than the fact that you had added treatment because of the human contact on the uh, State Water Project was probably the better supply to have but if you look at the energy cost at 3,000 kilowatt hours versus 2,000 you know it was better to have the Colorado River well, I do recall at times we were getting energy from Edison on the margin, the last acre foot of water through the Colorado River Aqueduct was running maybe, say, 20 mils per kilowatt hour. That equates to roughly $40 an acre foot. Well, under the supplier's contract on the state water project, it's 3 mils per kilowatt hour, and 3,000 kilowatt hours, it's 9 to $10 an acre foot. Well, that's kind of a no-brainer. You go ahead and you take the better quality water at the lesser cost, even though it's more energy intensive. That all changed in 83. The suppliers contract was gone at the three mills and their marginal cost was the same kind of marginal cost we were looking at at the Colorado River. And so the energy at 2,000 kilowatt hours for an acre foot pretty well demanded that we maximize the use of the Colorado River uh, 365 days a year, and that's what we started doing at that time. We had on and off up till that time done that, depending upon how uh, we were meeting our blending requirements. So it varies depending upon what the marginal resource is at any instant as to putting that energy into the grid and pumping that acre foot through the respective system. But generally speaking now for the long term, Colorado River Aqueduct supply is the cheapest. The, quantity, the problem is the demands on the Colorado River Aqueduct have gone up with the completion of the Central Arizona project. And at the same time, there's been a drought on the river and so our supplies available from the Colorado River system aren't sufficient to keep the aqueduct running full. Okay. Well, and speaking of that, I mean, that's a great transition uh, to the last couple of subjects uh, that we can deal with here. Uh, IID-1, it has become known as IID-1, and that's the first agreement, the original agreement, between the Imperial Irrigation District and Metropolitan. Uh, the Palo Verde Land Fallowing Program, which came after that, and uh, to a lesser degree, I suppose, the Arizona Groundwater Storage Program. Uh, I believe that you were involved in all three of those in one way or another. And it's only fair to say that uh, other people uh, who are part of this oral history project who were m perhaps more directly involved with those, or maybe for a longer period of time, uh, have already been interviewed, so uh, you know I, I say that just so you don't have to uh, uh, replow some old ground. But we are interested in knowing what your direct involvement was in in those, and yeah, you know, some of the characters that you ran across, or some of the issues that you had to deal with, or some of the unique things that came up uh, during that period. Uh, so, given that, let's start with IID-1 first, and again, that's an agreement between Imperial Irrigation District and Metropolitan, whereby Met paid to conserve the water, and IID 
sent to Metropolitan the water thus conserved. I mean, that's that's the nutshell. So what's the nut? <laughs> I would begin getting more involved in the Colorado River water negotiations about 1984-85. Uh, at that time, um, IID was getting increasing pressure for the Salton Sea rising up and there were some lawsuits that were filed over their waste of water and the State Water Resources Control Board held a series of hearings and the issue out there was that if, if gone to fruition and all the lawsuits had been settled, etc., maybe IID would have to pay for the conservation and conserve the water without any help from an outside agency. In Metropolitan's perspective, there were some unknowns in that lawsuit, and there also were the issues of we could afford to pay for the water as long as we get the guarantee, because we had a low priority on the river. We knew there was going to be a time that we might be cut off, so we wanted to get a higher priority to that water, and so if we paid for the cost, we wanted to guarantee the water that was conserved. Hence the basis for the negotiations, and those got rather drawn out for a long period of time. Not to mention of which, of course, as in many negotiations, the issue was price. Uh, there was a lot of thinking that the price of the water should reflect the price that we sold the water for, instead of what the cost was for the conservation. Uh, those negotiations went on for three or four years, I think it was 88 that the final activities were completed, uh, and I was very much involved towards the end, uh, both with the final agreement where I worked with Bob Edmondson, who was a consultant that was hired by ID to see if he could basically get away from a lot of the political infighting that had been going on between the agencies and get down to some of the nitty-gritty engineering end of the agreement that might work. And one of the keys, I think, in that agreement, uh, I guess I'll take the credit for it, was to try and find a way where the boards weren't having to approve every conservation agreement that went on in Imperial, but instead there was a coordinating committee that was going to be composed of a staff person from Imperial and a staff person from Metropolitan and then a third person at large and not having much of a background in terms of the water business of how these coordinating committees should be formed. If you actually look at the details of the agreement and that coordinating committee I lifted it very liberally from the Reed Gardner Power Plant Agreement and the coordinating committee that was between DWR and Nevada Power Company in coordinating that power operation. And actually that is one of the keys, I think, to making that agreement work. We were able to write a check for $100 million and they were able to conserve 100,000 acre foot and I think that agreement came in at cost and we're getting 100,000 acre feet and basically avoided a lot of the political problems that we were having with the earlier discussions with the two agencies. But the, the agreement was not uh, agreeable, if you will, uh, to everyone in Imperial. I mean, that was, uh, that was a difficult uh, agreement to come to, was it not, uh, in terms of the two boards METS board and IID's board? And well, uh, some of the underlying problems that existed was just having an m &I water user come in and take over 100,000 acre foot of your water supply. m and uh, standing? I mean, a ghost town could be developed eventually. And there was a lot of concerns of just once the camel gets his nose into the tent, look out. M and I standing for municipal and industrial use, okay. as opposed uh, to I mean, if you look at the overall use of a quantity of water, um, I don't know what the numbers are in today's world of an acre foot of water and how much of the GMP it might produce. But if you look at it in agriculture versus in a 
the use in a municipal and industrial purpose, the factors like 10 to 1 better for the higher purpose of municipal and industrial. That doesn't help the average farmer that basically had his grandfather develop the farm and has been farming this way and suddenly you get all this socioeconomic dislocation and there are lots of ramifications that can happen from taking water away from the farmers in terms of not just that farm going out of production, you also have the party that provides the tractor to that farm, you have the seed production, it has a lot of far-reaching impacts and anytime these activities are done you need to look at all of them. The nice thing about the conservation program was that we weren't changing any of the water needed for the agricultural purposes on the farm, we were just finding a way to more efficiently use the water that they did have on the farm and injecting the hundred million dollars into their economy in the process, which really provided a win-win situation. But you had to get into more the thinking of the farming community in order to get over the hurdle. And uh, anyhow, that I, I did work a lot on the details of the final contract with Bob and Edmondson, and then later in the, oh, I forget what the term was that we used for it, but it was an amendment to it because we needed other parties to buy into the program or else they could have picked off the water once we saved it. We needed Powell Birdie's write off and we needed uh, Coachella's sign off as well. And they got something yeah. for signing off. Well, Coachella Look. got potentially half the water supply when they needed it. Right. Uh, did that, uh, let's move then to Palo Verde, did that, uh, I mean, you you talked really about what are called third party impacts, uh, you talked about uh, farmers and the camel under the tent and all that kind of stuff. So did that experience help you when you went into Palo Verde and attempted to do something different there? Yes. Uh, Palo Verde's situation is a lot different than Imperial's in terms of the region, uh, the extent of the farming. And where they're located, etc. But we had been trying to negotiate an actual land following program where you would take some land out of production for a period of time and get the water that was conserved from it. Uh, there had been a template somewhat worked up. At one time there was a nuclear power plant that San Diego Gas and Electric was trying to build called the Sun Desert Project and they needed a water supply for that and they negotiated with Palo Verde to actually follow the land and they were going to permanently take the land out of production and take the water from that uh, uh, land that was out of production and use it as a cooling water for their, their power plant. So they even bought some farmland down in uh, Palo Verde in order to accomplish this purpose. Uh, so we had somewhat of a template, they had had some experience with it and uh, the people were not as negative for us moving into that, but we had some major difficulty getting over certain hurdles on how to implement the provisions of it. Um, I wasn't involved in the early negotiations on it, and later on when we attempted to move it forward, I did get involved in it and basically told them the actual implementation and what have you is how you want to implement it. My only concern is that the price be right and that we get the water. In terms of how you handle the third parties, uh, how you handle the overall following, because we're not going to do it every year. We still want the land to be in production when we're not needing the water supply. Um, you need to find a way to work up the program and we'll write it into the agreement so that it minimizes the impact on the valley. And that's really what they seem to want to have somebody understand, that there are, you know, as an example, you, you can fallow land, but if you don't do it properly, it could turn into a dust bowl. The, there's no growth there, there's no uh, heavy dirt clods out there and the wind blows across and it can be a real disaster in the area. And uh, this was somewhat different than, uh, th th there had been, quote, a form of land fallowing, only it wasn't for purposes of uh, providing a water supply, it was basically the Soil Conservation Service had done this as a means of not producing surplus crops. And so they had some experience with these kinds of things and uh, much of what was in, we decided to do it as a test, see if both parties liked the agreement so that it wasn't going to be 
too prohibitive expensive and both people could get out of it. And we needed to have a way that we would get the guarantee to the water for a period of time because at the time we were running a full aqueduct, the reservoirs were down somewhat, it looked like we could use an insurance policy. And so we got the federal government agree to store the water that we saved from the program in Lake Mead for eight years. It did eventually spill, but we got the guarantee of an insurance policy for eight years. And so we met those various combination of events. And, uh, and, and, and I started out by telling them if we gave them the same price, well, the early offers that we were making to them for the land following programs were just what they were going to make as a net profit if they farm the land. Well, they're farmers, they like to farm. And if you're going to do that, they're going to continue farming. I told them we'll pay them more than what they were getting for farming. Might not be a lot more, but we were going to pay them some more than that. And anyhow, we met a lot of their demands and that helped uh, set the, the, the way for a, and I think it was a very successful test program and we did get oh, I don't think it was a full hundred thousand acre foot, but it was a a sizable amount for two years, some 180,000 acre foot, 175,000 that we backed into Lake Mead and the first time I ever know that an independent entity had stored water on the Colorado River system. It had always been everybody's water before. And uh, anyhow, we got through that hurdle. We did work the test program out and I think that helped pave the way for the longer term agreement that finally came to fruition. It must have been interesting only from the standpoint that Palo Verde Irrigation District is famous for being very protective of their their status as the highest rights holder in California. So, uh, very good. Uh, let's move out of California then and we'll finish up with, uh, I think you were involved in the Arizona Groundwater Storage Program whereby Metropolitan actually stored water, literally stored water in Arizona. Uh, very unusual project. Correct. This was, uh, I think it was in the early 90s. We had formed a committee of the three basin states to discuss ways to use the Colorado system more beneficially to the benefit of all the three lower basin states. And it was somewhat set up on an informal basis in the past whenever any of these discussions were kicked up or started, um, the politicians and the newspapers would get a hold of it and suddenly the thing would be shut down because everybody was suspicious that somebody else was going to steal their water and uh, so we found it much more beneficial to do it on a low key, no obligations, just have a general session where you could have discussions on how to more beneficially use the Colorado River system. And one of the things is during the buildup on the CAP, as the Central Arizona Project was building up its demands, it didn't have full use of its whole system. It wasn't storing all the water it could. The Colorado River system had extra water, and the thinking was that another state would pay to move that extra water into Arizona. They had plenty of places to put it because they had been mining the groundwater and had some major subsidence in some areas. So they had places to put it in the ground. As long as we paid the extra cost, we could store that water for them. And then at some later time when they were having their full demands on the system, they would draw that water out of the groundwater and we would get an equivalent amount of the water they would have taken from their aqueduct and pump it through our Colorado River aqueduct. Again, there was a lot of suspicion on this, so we went forth on a test basis for a very small amount of water. Um, I think I recall it was 100,000 acre foot, and then to get a consensus buy-in by other parties, we agreed to share it with the state of Nevada. So we each stored 50,000 acre foot, and then later on, the cost of it got a little bit more expensive. They started looking at additional costs to put on it and Nevada decided they didn't want to share in it. We went forward and stored some additional. I think we wound up with, I thought it was almost 100,000 acre foot, but I could be confused by that amount. Was the nature of that agreement a one-time, a short-term deal, or is it, was it an ongoing? It was a test program, and um, 
I know there's ongoing discussions on it right now. The biggest problem is we is getting it back out. You, there were provisions in there that you had to get it out at a time that it wasn't going to harm the CAP. And I think actually it, I had talked with somebody at MEP just recently. I thought it was going to be this year that we were going to get some of it back to help us out in this, this current year. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, all right. Well, this has been uh, very good. And uh, I don't know about you, but for me, the time just really flew by. Anything I've forgotten to ask? Anything that's leaping to your mind that you want to? Five year career, there probably was a lot of it, but this has been a great day. Yeah. Okay. Uh, very good. Well, Bob, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate okay. it.